In this video, we're going to briefly go over the ANSI A300 pruning standards and some of the best management practices. We're not going to cover all of them, but we'll give you kind of a flavor of, of what you could expect. So if you went to your doctor, you wouldn't just say, hey, what the heck, just start cutting, right? What could go wrong? Clearly, you'd want your doctor to uh, ask you some questions, figure out why you were there, um, and figure out what the objective of uh, a surgery or whatever it is you're going to see your doctor for, right? And so we should think the same basically for pruning. I don't know what this particular guy's objective is. Again, another video or another image sent in from a former student who took this out of her window apparently while she was getting ready for class one day and came in and said, you've got to see this picture. Um, I don't know what this particular person objective is. You can see all sorts of really, really poor, um, really poor branch cuts here left over, not to mention a total lack of PPE or safety equipment, uh, you know, power lines, all sorts of issues with this. What we're really, uh, and, and this is another one, what was the objective here? Was it to keep this tree? I can't imagine that this tree is providing much benefit uh, looks fairly uh, in, in bad shape, lots of terrible pruning, right? So you want to make sure that you're really thinking about what you're doing. In fact, the best management practices state no tree should be pruned without a clearly defined objective. So it's important to really consider what the heck it is you're doing before you just start making cuts. Okay, so here you want to evaluate why is just as important as when and how. And when I've worked with uh, folks, both uh, professional arborists, municipal foresters, and the general public, the, usually their first questions are, well, when should I prune? When is it okay to prune? The honest answer to that is you can prune pretty much any time of the year. Some species you have to be more cautious with because of particular diseases that might be around in an area like oak wilt. Um, you don't want to prune during oak wilt season. You'd want to wait till after that season with emerald ash borer and Dutch elm disease. Usually you like to, if you can, prune outside of the flying time of the insects. Um, but generally speaking, yeah, you can prune any time of the year. Arborists and urban foresters don't simply take off all of summer because it's the growing season. So you can prune whenever. Rarely do people ask, what should I be pruning for? They just want to know, how do I make the cut and when should I make the cut? Okay, so the objectives that are outlined in the ANSI standards are to improve structure, risk mitigation, which we've talked a bit about, provide clearance, uh, maintain health, we'll talk a little bit about that, uh, reduce density of the foliage, uh, restoration, if there's been injury to the tree already, there is a way to restore the pruning, and then you can do some, improve the aesthetics or improve a view um, and sometimes improving a view is, is more of a safety issue than anything else. So risk mitigation, we've already looked at these, but failures during storm, damages to utilities. This right here is, is a clear co-dominant leader that could have been pruned out beforehand and before this uh, had, had broken out. Improve the view. You need to know how to prune. In this case, you could argue that you just shouldn't have planted a tree there, but let's say you do have branches that are blocking a stop sign. That's a safety issue, so you need to be able to prune those out. All right, tree health and condition. Um, you want to minimize the decay. Typically, you want to prune at the smallest wounds possible, which usually means you want to prune when the branch or the tree itself is younger. If you're waiting till branches are very large, um, you're going to have some decay. Here you can see this branch looks to me like this was probably torn out and then just pruned off. You can actually see through Part of that branch there so arguably you could come and prune this tree right here uh, in order to remove what's above it because that's clearly a weak issue and would cause probably not too much damage to the tree health but certainly the tree condition and the potential of the condition of the people standing underneath the tree would be negatively impacted in a failure. Pruning method for structural. Here, before you start looking, uh, if this is the tree you're presented with, and A, B, and C are the lines we're going to look at, you can see where they've clearly drawn out. So A, which would have been this branch right here, we're pruning that off. This is a very particular method of pruning to develop a nice single straight trunk or leader, a single leader. 
straight, it'll eventually straighten out um, as the competing branches and more access to sunlight are there. So B is the branch or the main leader you're trying to identify, and then C you're coming through and you're just trying to remove again these competing leaders so you don't have co-dominant leaders. When you do it when it's small, relatively easy, inexpensive, and safety of the person pruning it is, is obviously improved when working with smaller branches. Scaffolding branches, these are the branches that uh, form the main structure of the tree. And so typically for large trees, the standard is to look for, the best management is to look for a tree, those branches to be around 18 inches to 24 inches apart. So you can see um, the one on the left, these look fairly well spaced for the most part. The one on the right, you can see one of these two branches probably should have been removed uh, earlier in the life of this tree. To remove them now would change the structure of the tree, plus you'd be having these really large pruning wounds. On smaller trees, thinking of these ornamental crab apples, things like that, you'd probably have uh, branches that are only about eight inches apart, and that's okay. Uh, selective removal, so 25% of the crown uh, removed in a single season. Now this varies, and you'll hear some, and there's a, a, a guy out of Florida, Ed Gilman, who has looked at these and said, look, it's not so much the 25%, it's more are you pruning uh, intentionally, and do you know what you're doing? Do you have good objectives formed? Plus, it's really hard to determine 25% if you just cut off a bunch of branches and look at it and think, I don't know, is that 25%? Hard to tell. Um, here, some of this is going to vary based on species and age. Some trees you can prune a little more heavily than others without negative consequences. And we're looking at the use of subordination cuts. So here we're subordinating branches by removing some of the more vigorous growth, cutting it back. It still allows the, the remaining portion of the branch to be photosynthetically active, which is great. You can see here this branch was growing out uh, the dotted lines being removed, but you can see that this branch is growing out fairly vigorously. If we prune that back, the remaining portion of the branch will grow a little bit slower and that'll allow more upward growth of the canopy where maybe it's more beneficial or that's what we'd like to see. Co-dominance and leaders, we're clearly looking to remove these. On um, that picture on the left, really difficult to do at this point. I don't know how you even get your saw in there to make good cuts that will seal over. You can see this cut here we looked at in the biology of the pruning. That cut is not a great cut. We don't have a symmetric formation of the callus or wound wood. On these trees, a little bit younger and smaller, still a good opportunity. We could make these into single stem trees without losing too much. You could remove this branch here and then remove this and this branch and then maybe um, do some reduction cuts on some of these and then you'd have a nice straight or a nice single leader. Over time, uh, it will, when you initially do it, it'll look a little awkward, but over time that tree will grow over where you've made those cuts and you should have, shouldn't be very obvious within a few years. Subordination cuts. These are cuts to reduce the size and ensuing growth uh, rate of a branch or leader. That's that um, trying to reduce the branch vigor. Okay, this is, these are subordination cuts. These, um, and you can do these via some reduction. So here we're reducing the actual branch uh, length. And that's reducing it from the top, not from the inside out, which we'll look at later. That's something we want to avoid. Branch reduction is not topping, and topping is never okay according to the standard and really the biology of the tree. Everything you see here, these are all mostly what we refer to as epicormic sprouts, which we've talked about earlier in the semester, and those branches tend not to be very well attached, and so they have a higher tendency of failure. Here you can see these trees have been topped multiple times. You can see even from a distance there's some decay in, in these areas, and all the way down, just topped. Topped is basically just reduce it uh, to some height. I want the tree to be 25 feet tall. Just cut it off at 25 feet with no regard to the tree biology or how it's, how it's actually growing. And that's what they refer to these inter, uh, should be internodal cuts basically through, throughout the tree. Cautionary tale about epicormic shoots. 
<clears throat> we've talked about this, I think, a little bit already this semester, but essentially, if you're climbing a tree and you throw it over epicormic shoots, partly because a tree has been topped and maybe it's a different company had come in and you can't tell that it was topped at this point, and you throw your, your line over that, there's the potential that that branch can tear out. Great book, by the way, if you're interested in this, The Wild Trees. Um, talks a lot about the redwoods and climbing. It's a true story about multiple people that have worked in the redwoods and climbing the redwoods. Very cool. Uh, cleaning. So before cleaning, you can see branches, stubs, broken. Cleaning is really going in and removing all of the sort of damaged or undesirable branches or dead branches. After cleaning, the main structure of the tree remains the same. You're simply trying to remove stubs and just really clean it up. Uh, it's the easiest way to think about it. The raising method, this is done very commonly for street trees where you need to have, you need to maintain some minimal height clearance for traffic and that typically would be somewhere around 14 or 15 feet for most streets in an urban area. And so here you're essentially selecting branches at the base and, and, and sometimes people call it limbing it up. What they're pointing out here is live crown ratio um, and the, or the they're pointing out that you want to leave a good live crown. So in urban trees, for deciduous trees, we're usually looking somewhere around 60%. For conifers in urban areas, we're looking around maybe 70, 75%. If you were in a forested area, conifers might be more in the 30% uh, live crown ratio. Again, there the objectives are different. You're not looking for tree benefits. You're looking more for timber production and things of that nature. Restoration pruning, this is essentially coming in and you've got some storm damage here, so you're pruning that off. And with storm damage, you often get these really vigorous sprouts. And so you're trying to select. You don't want to remove them all because the tree is going to need that photosynthetic material in order to, to grow new tissue and recover on its own. So restoration pruning is really focusing on which one of these can I reduce or remove completely and can we clean up any uh, broken, jagged edges? Again, the tree doesn't actually care, but if we can get the branch to seal over a little bit faster, that, that can be helpful with reducing the potential hazard of that tree in the future. Um, these images are courtesy of Ed Gilman out of Florida, and he's done a lot of great work on storm recovery of pruning. So. Um, many stems. So this tree was damaged in a storm and you can see that a lot of these stems just growing really thick in here and a lot of co-dominant leaders and the potential for problem especially uh, as the tree continues to grow. So remove two of the upright stems you can see here um, removing out, kind of thinning it out. Looks a little awkward for right now but as the tree continues to grow you'll get some side or lateral branches that fill in throughout and it will look less less awkward as it goes. So before you can see really really tight branch attachment and instead of removing all of this and just having one here they're doing selective removement so really tight codominance that's right here and so now and then so now you're left with just one straighter and then what they've done with this branch is actually done a reduction cut so it likely, it looks like they'd had a branch going up this way. So reducing that down reduces the vigor of this branch, but leaves it there to maximize photosynthetic potential. Structural pruning, again, taking a look at this uh, before you're looking at it. So here you're just trying to develop the future structure of the tree. This is really what most uh, city and, and, and arborists working with younger trees should be focused on, structural removing of branches to make sure that you have really good mature structure that requires less pruning or that you have to prune fewer large branches and can withstand maybe more storms and doesn't have many tear outs that causes the tree to be completely removed. Uh, here we looked at um, this branch right here should have been removed. And this is thinking about this article that we had looked at earlier, this branch uh, to stem diameter ratio and the effects on strength of attachment. Here, this is a street tree taken just earlier this year. You can see this natural structure of a single leader really would have been great. And it, but this branch now is about the same size as this trunk. 
And what would have been nice is if this branch had been removed earlier, now they're about the same size, causing this overall to be a weaker attached. And there's a higher potential that this branch union right here will fail in a storm, and probably a normal storm, Not doesn't have to be a really severe storm. And so that should have been removed. And you could still remove it at this point, um, although you are creating a larger wound but still reasonably small enough tree to remove that and not be too concerned. Uh, here, I didn't take a before picture of this, which I wish I'd have done. Anyway, this had a branch coming up this way, so we had two trunks, a co-dominant, and we basically, I cut this right here to remove it, and I select it. How do you select which one you want to keep? Well, you kind of look at the whole thing, and you see which one's maybe growing the straightest or the thickest or has the best growth on it, or is the least worst of the two. Uh, sometimes that's the choice you're making. But this way, instead of having a co-dominant leader that might tear out a storm in the future, we've removed that. And over time, this trunk will grow, encompass that. You won't even see that pruning wound exterior. <laughs> waiting too long. Here you can see these are all old pruning wounds. Massive decay through this tree is actually still there, probably still standing because it's in a little bit more of a protected area, and most of its crown is gone or pretty thin, and so it's not really catching the wind, but all of this trunk through here, you can see decay in each of these large pruning wounds. Uh, it's almost hollow, so I would, wouldn't be surprised if the bulk of this trunk is hollow. Um, how do you mitigate this risk? How can you prune through it? Well, I would argue for basal pruning, which is just tree removal in this particular case, and then planting something else there. Thinning uh, used to be that people would come in and they'd thin, and you still see this quite a bit. They come in, they thin all the lower and all the interior. You end up with something like this, really clear, uh, and that's what they thought was good for thinning. This is inappropriate. You don't want to do this. This is a more appropriate thinning, where you're coming in and you're just reducing the number of branches so you get a little more wind passage through there. Not uncommon to do this, particularly for fruit producing trees, uh, so that you can get wind and air movement and more light in there and can help reduce the amount of diseases that come in and affect fruit production. Uh, in some cases where trees, usually with forest grown trees, they naturally thin. And so when we take a tree that's used to or has evolved growing in a deep forest and then we put it out in the middle of our yard, it'll grow a lot more branches than maybe are good in terms of people living with that tree and the potential for those branches to fail. So thinning allows us to basically help reduce some of the potential uh, failures in the future. This is often in, done incorrectly and often done from the outside, not the inside and it leads to uh, lion's tailing. So this is lion's tailing. Note this branch, I know it's a little hard to see, but you can see this branch has been cleared of anything growing off of it all the way out to this end. Now you can imagine when the leaves are fully on this, this branch is gonna weigh a lot more and pull down, and then you add something like a little bit of wind or some rain, and this branch is gonna have a lot more pressure on it. And it's just like a lever. If you pull on the outside of a lever, it'll break somewhere through here. And if there's any decay, which there might be from previous wounds or just any weakness in here, you notice that this branch doesn't have much taper to it. If you look at some of these other branches, you'll see that they actually do taper a little bit more. This one basically has uh, very, very little taper. And so this is lion's tailing. Still see this quite a bit, not something you wanna do. So in our next video, we'll look at the actual pruning techniques.